Well, good morning. My name is Terry Austria. I'm one of the team members here at Stone Creek Church. And once again, we would like to welcome you. Can you believe we are already one week into our 21 days of prayer? And people have been responding. I know that people have been praying through our prayer patterns. The attendance on our Wednesday prayer gatherings has been going up. Our Francophone ministry has been praying at our Midtown campus every day. A week ago, we had 20 college students who were praying also um, in an all-day all prayer chain. So it's been amazing what God has been doing. So we want to encourage you this Wednesday, if you're available, 6.30 a.m., noon, and 6.30 p.m., we are going to be having prayer services right here in the sanctuary. We also want to let you know about something special coming up on Sunday night, February 25th. It is our encounter night at 6.30 p.m. It's going to be an extended time of prayer and praise in God's presence. We're going to have as our guest worship leader, Christy Northup, who is a longtime friend of Stone Creek. And if you've never experienced her ministry before, you are in for an amazing time of worshiping God and spending time in his presence. We want to let you know that one of our focuses for that evening is going to be praying for those who need healing. So if you know of anyone, spiritual, emotional healing, please don't hesitate to invite them. And we're going to agree with them in prayer for their miracle. Now, as was said earlier, yesterday was the first day of the lunar calendar. This is a holiday that's celebrated by close to 2 billion people. That's almost 25% of the global population. And it's represented by many people who attend Stone Creek Church, but also within our community. So with them in mind, we would like to wish everyone again a happy Lunar New Year. Now, that being said, there's many people here who are wearing red and gold. And that has nothing to do with the two teams that are going to be playing in the Super Bowl tonight. So... Just out of curiosity, who's for San Francisco? And then who's for Kansas City? Who hopes they both lose? Who's for the food? Wait, aren't we supposed to be in the middle of a fast? Mm -hmm. So let's turn to John chapter 12. As we look at the message today. I want to give you a little bit of background. The Israelite people are gathering in Jerusalem for the Passover, and we see that Jesus' influence has been continuing to grow over the last three years, especially after he raises Lazarus from the dead. People are crowding in from miles around to hear this carpenter's son from Nazareth. And so on Palm Sunday, we see Jesus entering into the holy city, again, to celebrate the Passover in the temple. And people are laying palms on the ground, and they're beginning to cry out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But this is the first time I read it this way as I look through John. And the king of Israel. And as I began to meditate on that passage, I was beginning to think, is it possible that the people in Jerusalem knew that Jesus came from the tribe of Judah, which means that he was in direct line of King David? I'm starting to think that possibly the people in Jerusalem were trying to politicize Jesus, that they had a wrong idea of who the Messiah was going to come to be, that they were going to free them politically and militarily from the Romans. But we know because we've read the book that Jesus was actually coming to free people spiritually. So in an attempt to dismantle any political agenda that the people had for him, he enters into Jerusalem not on a war horse, but on a humble donkey. And he doesn't enter in as a conquering warrior, but as a humble servant. So we see here in verse 20, now there were a number of foreigners from among the nations who were worshipers of the feast. They went to Philip and they asked him, would you take us to see Jesus? We want to see him. So Philip went to find Andrew and then they both went to inform Jesus. He replied to them, now is the time for the son of man to be glorified. So at that moment, I'm sure people are starting to get excited. They're like, okay, this is what we've been waiting for. This is the one who's going to free us. And then Jesus changes the, changes the menu on them. Let me make this clear. A single grain of wheat will never be more than a single grain of wheat unless it drops into the ground and dies. Because then it sprouts and produces a great harvest of wheat, all because one grain died. The person who loves his life and pampers himself will miss true life. But the one who detaches his life from this world and abandons himself to me will find true life and enjoy it forever. If you want to be my disciple, follow me and you will go where I am going. 
And if you truly follow me as my disciple, the Father will shower his favor upon your life. So the title of my message today is Brokenness, the Path to God's Favor. So there's different kinds of brokenness. Obviously, we live in a broken world. Many of us have experienced broken families or broken lives. Life happens to us many times because we make bad choices and it causes sorrow and grief. But today, we're not going to be talking about the brokenness that happens to us, but rather a brokenness that happens in us. It's a brokenness that leads to spiritual renewal and vitality that gets us in the right relationship with God and with other people. So three thoughts I want to share briefly with you today. First of all, we ask the question, what is brokenness? We might even be wondering, well, how can anything broken be beneficial? You think about your washer, your dryer, or even your car. How could those be beneficial if there's something wrong with it? Well, it says in verse 24, a single grain of wheat will never be more than a single grain of wheat unless it drops into the ground and dies. You look at that passage, that is literally what Jesus did. As the Prince of Peace, dwelling in the throne room of God with his Father, angels attended to him. At the right moment, we know the Christmas story, he drops literally to the ground. We know that he's born in a stable and placed in a feeding trough or a manger. We know at that moment that the infinite merged with the finite, that divinity merged with the earthly, that God and human became one. We know that the omnipotent one took on our vulnerabilities, limitations, and even our temptations. Do you think it was a little bit humbling for the Prince of Peace, the very Son of God, to become human? In Psalm 22, verse 6, we see a prophetic messianic verse saying, But I am like a worm, crushed, treated as less than human, despised and scorned by everyone. If you think about how humbling it would be for any of us to become as a worm, to be scrounging around on the ground on the sidewalk just to be squashed by someone walking down the street or to be burrowing through the dirt, think of how humbling it was for the Son of God to become a human being. It says it very clearly in Philippians chapter 2. And consider the example that Jesus set before us. Let his mindset become your motivation. He existed in the form of God Yet he gave no thought to seizing equality with God as his supreme prize. Instead, he emptied himself of his outward glory by reducing himself to the form of a lowly servant. He became human. He humbled himself and became vulnerable, choosing to be revealed as a man and was obedient. So the definition of the word brokenness is to be reduced to fragments, to be weakened, to be tamed, to be trained, to be totally submitted and surrendered, and as we've already said the word, to be humble. Jesus chose to lay down his rights and his privileges, his very life, and make himself nothing. But he didn't just die on the cross. Jesus died to his flesh. There's another word that we see in Galatians chapter 5. Flesh is our ambitions, our desires, the part of us that wants its own way. The part of us that is contrary to the cross. The part of us that's constantly at war with the spirit. You want me to keep going? Okay, the second thought. How are we broken? How are we broken? And you're like, please tell us, how can we be broken today? Verse 26, if you want to be my disciple, follow me and you will go where I'm going. Jesus told his disciples 22 times in the Gospels to follow him. But we've got to ask ourselves, where was Jesus headed? He was headed to the cross. And we know that when he was bound and arrested, he didn't call upon his father's angels. When he was accused, he didn't defend himself. When he was struck, he didn't strike back. When he was slapped, he turned the other cheek. When they whipped him, he didn't curse them. When nails were placed through his hands and his feet, he said, Father, forgive them. Do we really want to follow Christ? You know, during the Last Supper, Jesus addressed his disciples and said, the shepherd is going to be struck and all of the sheep will be scattered. And they all began to argue among themselves that they were never going to abandon him. And Peter stands up and says, Lord, even if I have to die for you, I will not deny you. But yet we know that Peter, just a few hours later, denied Christ three times. So 
So what is our response when it comes to having our flesh broken? We react when we're overlooked. We retaliate when we're attacked. We demand our own way. And we're anything but silent. We cross-reference verse 26 with Matthew 16. If you truly want to follow me, you should at once completely reject and disown your own life. And you must be willing to share my cross and experience it as your own as you continually surrender to my ways. So to be a disciple of Christ means that we are willing to be broken, that we're willing to reject and disown our own lives, to let go of our idols, money, power, possessions, dreams, plans, our education, our careers, and even all of our relationships. We let go of anything that causes instant gratification, that seeks after comfort and convenience and justification, any part of us that wants to exalt or benefit ourselves. We also are willing to surrender to God's ways. That simply means that we're willing to obey him, that we can surrender all of the pain that's been caused by other people, that we can surrender resentment, anger, jealousy, greed, selfishness, and all the other self, self-reliance, self-centeredness, self-sufficiency, self-righteousness, and self-preservation. What we're asking God to do is to break our entitlement, where we surrender the need to be right, and realizing that it's not just about surrendering our rights, but realizing that in Christ, we don't have any rights. I'll ask it again. Do you want me to still go on? Do you want me to keep going here? We're saying, Jesus, help me to embrace the cross. That means we embrace the cross that reveals the stubbornness in our souls, that reveals our sin, that causes us to look up at the cross and see Jesus and realize, I caused that. I'm the reason that Jesus died. We see in Psalm 51, verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you will not despise. Now, that word contrite is very interesting. In the Hebrew, it literally means to crush and to pulverize. So if God's going to honor a contrite heart, that means he's going to allow us and we give him permission to crush and to pulverize our flesh. So that means that brokenness is repentance and grief over unconfessed habitual sin. Now, Sorrow and sadness and tears are great, but it's not just brokenness over our sin. It's brokenness from our sin. Brokenness is also a heartfelt response saying, God, I want to live for you. And with your help, I choose not to sin. I choose to live for you. Brokenness is a volitional decision saying, God, would you destroy my pride and everything that keeps me from you? Brokenness also begs, God, soften my cold, hardened heart. Would you mold me and use me for your glory? Brokenness declares, God, I give up. You're in control. Brokenness produces a healthy fear of God, which means we have a deep reverence for him. The things of God are no longer mundane or ordinary, that we're assigning to God our highest attention and our highest affection. Brokenness isn't the end of the journey either. It's the beginning toward wholeness, a lifelong process with the Holy Spirit's help. Brokenness longs to know God deeper in prayer, in the word. Not just on Wednesdays, not just during the 21 days of prayer and fasting, but daily going after God and getting into his presence. It's when we can say, God, in the first thing in the morning, I want to know you more. The last thing on our minds that the, when we go to sleep at night is like, I want to know about Jesus. Brokenness is not just dying to self. It's also rising anew from the ashes Embracing who God is creating us to be, a new creation. And I would also say this, brokenness is the doorway from the superficial to the supernatural. So it's turning around here. When we allow ourselves to be broken, God's wanting to do something awesome in return. So what are the results of brokenness? We see here in verse 24, speaking of a single grain of wheat, it sprouts and produces a great harvest of wheat, all because one grain died. So we ask ourselves again, as we look, there's many contradictory statements here that Jesus is making. How could death produce life? But he says, only by the single grain of wheat falling to the ground, its hard case cracking and unleashing 
what's inside. Jesus himself in his own body demonstrates how death to self produces supernatural encounters revealing God's nature and his character. So here's four examples out of Jesus' walk over three years that we want to look at. First of all, his baptism. John chapter 1, verse 29. Very familiar passage as Jesus was approaching the Jordan River and his cousin, John the Baptist, is baptizing many for the forgiveness of their sins. And John the Baptist says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. The one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Now, we want to point out that Jesus, as he approached the Jordan River, didn't have to be baptized. He's God. Why should he have to go through this religious act? But he said, to fulfill all acts of righteousness, I will do this. He chose to humble himself. Now, as we look at this passage in John chapter 1, it's very interesting that there's two animals mentioned there, a lamb and a dove. Think about how ferocious those creatures are, a lamb or a dove. Actually, it's quite the contrary. If we had a dove right here on the platform and all of a sudden I clapped my hands really loudly or I screamed, that dove would fly away. It's because the lamb and the dove, their nature is gentle and meek. So we ask ourselves the question, why should we be broken and humble as the children of God? Is it because God is so awesome and powerful? Well, those are good reasons to be humble and broken. But the very reason I believe that we should be is because God's nature is humble and peaceful, which is why he chose those two creatures to represent himself. And as the Lamb of God, Jesus, submits to be baptized by his cousin, a lesser being, a human being, we see the Spirit of God come upon him and anoint him for ministry. This is the birth of what's going to be taking place for the next three years. And it's a crucial moment. Jesus knows that there's going to be a lot of pressure on his soldiers. Not only is he going to the cross, but people are going to be looking to him for the forgiveness of their sins, for freedom from any bondage that they're undergoing. And he has so many different temptations. Could he take this on himself? He's going to grow in popularity. People are going to be rushing to hear him. But yet he chooses immediately to go out into the wilderness to die to himself. He goes on this fast for 40 days and for 40 nights. And I guarantee you, even though it's not mentioned, that he goes into a season of deep prayer and meditating on God's word. At the end of that fast, we see that the enemy comes to him and tempts him three times, threatening to destroy his mission. But once again, because Jesus allows himself to be broken in this fast, he has the power to say no to the enemy. In Matthew chapter 4, he says, go away, Satan. For the scriptures say, kneel before the Lord your God and worship only him. And at once the accuser left him, and angels suddenly gathered around Jesus to minister to his needs. Third, we see at the Last Supper. This is a very intimate moment as Jesus is wanting to spend his last few moments on earth with his best friends. He has spent the highs and the lows of the last three years with him, the good times and the bad times. And he just wants to celebrate this special meal honoring the Passover with the disciples. And he's wanting them to hear what he's saying as he's praying for them, that the Father would bless them and protect them after he goes away. And they're still not getting it because it says in Luke chapter 22, a dispute arose as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. How broken Jesus' heart must have been at that time. They're arguing over which one of them was going to be the greatest, which one of them was going to carry on the work. And Jesus just wanted to embrace them as his friends. So in one last attempt to demonstrate humility to them, he takes off his outer garments, wraps a towel around his waist, and begins to wash the feet of every single one of his disciples, including Judas, the one who's about to betray him. What a humbling act it should have been for the Son of God to be bowing before human beings. Shortly after that, as they're in the Garden of Gethsemane, 
Jesus is on his knees praying, asking the disciples to pray with him because they're going to be sifted later. It says that he was undergoing so much anguish that his perspiration was as blood dropping to the ground. He was growing anxious and nervous and in torment because he knew he was about to go to the cross. In Luke 22, it says, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. You see the temptation there to give up, the temptation to walk away. But he says, yet not my will, but yours be done. The anguish was so great that he repeated this two more times. This temptation again. But once again, Jesus appeals to his father. And because of his humility earlier in washing the feet of his disciples, Jesus receives the power to say yes to his father. Father, I'm going to do your will. Brokenness says not my will, but God's. Not my effort, not my agenda, not my desires, not my dreams, not my opinions, but Father, your will be done. And then we know at that moment that Judas arrives with the temple guard. They arrest Jesus and bring him to the house of Caiaphas where he's accused. False ac accusers are raised up to say different things about Jesus that he never said. They begin to slap him. They begin to spit on him. Hairs are ripped out of his beard. He's absolutely humiliated. And then they bring him to the governor where he is flogged with a whip. His blood begins to strike the ground. And then the Roman guards put a crown of thorns upon his head. He is forced to carry his own cross to Golgotha where they place nails through his hands and his feet. And he hangs there for hours. Once again, we see the lamb in perfect submission to the Father's plan. But hear me when I say this. Jesus was not merely the lamb because he died on the cross. He died on the cross because he already is the lamb and is now risen. And because he humbled himself on the cross, he won victory once and for all. This means he achieved for us forgiveness of sin. Now there's peace between man and God. We can all have eternal life. And death and the enemy have been defeated. But there was also something awesome that happened to Jesus, that he received all authority in heaven and on earth. Philippians chapter 2 says, Because of that obedience, God exalted him and multiplied his greatness. He has now been given the greatest of all names. The authority of the name of Jesus causes every need to bow in reverence. I tell our students this all the time. Brokenness puts God in his place, but it keeps us in ours. Now, I remember many years ago when Stone Creek started the college church on the U of I campus, I had the privilege of being part of the launch team. In fact, I was one of the associate pastors who oversaw our college ministry. In the first couple of years, our ministry continued to grow. We were experiencing success. But I'll say this, at the age of 24, doors started to open for me personally, where I was being offered the opportunities to preach at youth camps and youth retreats and conferences and even some of the larger churches in Illinois. And here's what was going on inside of me. I started thinking, I'm somebody. I finally made it. But I felt painfully miserable on the inside. I felt empty. And three years into full-time ministry, I believed that I had lost the passion. My heart had started to grow hardened and cold. And it also didn't help that the, min that the money wasn't coming in. I mean, I was working at a college church, so there was not a lot of finances. So I had to support my ministry hub by working at the Newman Hall Cafeteria. I was what was called a sanitary engineer in the plastics and metals division. Well, my job was to take the plastics and the metal and to sanitize them. But I was so desperate for God to do something in me. I knew I couldn't continue with. So I began to cry out to God and saying, God, I'm going to start on this fast. And I'm going to go as long as is necessary. I'm going to fast until... So I did what every mature Christian would do before they go on an extended fast. I went with a couple of our college students to Ryan's Steakhouse and Buffet <laughs> for the Last Supper. <laughs> and as I was gathered with the college students, they started to catch wind of what I was about to embark on. And some of them said, well, Terry, you're going to go on this fast. You're so spiritual. 
And I was like, no, 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 it's the exact opposite reason. I'm going on this fast because I'm not spiritual enough. And they said, well, why do you feel led to fast so much? Why do you like to fast? I'm like, I actually don't. If there wasn't 83 verses on fasting in the Bible, I'd be convinced it was of the devil. (laughs) But something pivotal happened at that moment. One of the college students looked at me and said, Terry, you know what? I've come to the point in my, real, in my life that I realize that in order for me to be happy, I have to be rich. And I looked at him and I said, you know what? I, I, I've come to realize that, you know, I would like to be rich also. But I also don't think that's what God has for me. And I believe that God has something even better, the riches of his kingdom. So I embarked on this fast and uh, just to make a long story short, um, I'll, I'll say that on day eight, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fast forward through some of this. On day eight, I was starting to grow in frustration because here I'm starving to death. I'm fasting. I'm really wrestling with this. And I'm saying, God, I need this breakthrough in my life. So I remember I was in my living room and I got down on my knees and I began to cry out to God. I was just praying. I was reading my Bible. And I had my eyes closed. I was laying prostrate before the Lord. And I started to envision this wall a wall that was so big that I couldn't see the top of it and I couldn't see the sides. And I realized that that wall represented my flesh and that God was on the other side of that wall. In my mind, I started banging on that wall and I started saying, God, can't you tear this wall down? And I thought it was going to be a Psalm 18 moment, hearing God's voice saying, yes, my son, I'm going to part the heavens and I'm going to come down and I'm going to rescue you with great lightning and great thunder. But I heard God's voice say, no. And I was like, what do you mean, no? You're God. You're supposed to be able to do anything. And God told me, we're going to tear this wall down one brick at a time. And then I thought to myself, man, we're going to be fasting for a very long time. (laughs) Well, I found out later that day that my boss, my pastor, was also on an extended fast. Kind of a coincidence, huh? And they were praying along the same lines for an open heaven above our church. Along those lines, we were also praying that we would have a Revelation 7 church. That means a church where worshipers would worship him from every tongue, tribe, nation, and people group. See, there was a problem with our church. While there was growth over the first couple of years, It was mostly Caucasians from the Chicago suburbs. We had a handful of international students, and as far as I know, there was only two African-American students. We wanted more and more people from every nation to be represented there. Now, please understand me when I say this. This was not bowing before some anthropological or sociological pressure. But it was always the DNA of Stone Creek to be a diverse church for all people. So we wanted a church that was going to reflect God's kingdom accurately. So many weeks went by, and we had a guest speaker. It was one of our African-American students' father, who was a pastor, and he came to preach for us. And at the end of his message, something very shocking happened. My boss, my pastor, brought in a basin of water, got down on his knees, and began to wash the feet of this African-American pastor. And then they switched places. My boss sat down on the chair, and the African-American pastor began to wash his feet. Now, I'd like to say that things happened instantly, but it's more of a gradual process. But I guarantee you that in this moment, doors started to open, that a process started week after week as more and more African-American students started attending the church, more and more people from the different nations. We started seeing walls of prejudice and ignorance fall to the ground. We went through different stages of lament, repentance, reconciliation, and healing. But yet we saw something else happening as the Holy Spirit continued to work in our hearts. We saw a tremendous outpouring of God's Spirit. Where four-hour prayer meetings on Sunday night with college students was not a strange thing. Where college students continued to repent until 1 o'clock in the morning. And that spring semester, over 30 students confessed Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And over the next year and a half, as the church continued to grow more than half of those students were African-American. Now, people asked us, was that because you and Dave fasted? No. My response was, God wanted to get us out of the way so that he could do something sovereign. 
And people ask, well, so why do you fast? And here's a strange answer that might cause some people to wonder, but just follow me here. I fast because I believe in spiritual shortcuts. When we fast, I believe that God works in accelerated ways. Fasting does not change God's mind. It changes us. But I'll say this. Personally, during this fast, not only did I experience a breakthrough, but I had such profound encounters with God that I didn't want to stop the fast. I remember one time in particular, I was on my way to my shift at the, at the cafeteria, and I barely had any time to pray before, before dinner time. So I just sat in my car. I had about 15 minutes, and I just began to worship the Lord. And God's presence was so evident right there in that car. It's like this heat just enveloped that car, and I just knew God was right there. Well, we understand that God's presence is always there. It's just that we grow in our attention of what he's actually doing. I had to make myself accountable to other people because I was depending more on the fast for this thrill of being in God's presence rather than on God himself. But it says here in verse 26, if you truly follow me as my disciple, the Father will shower his favor upon your life. So the word favor is defined as divine kindness or an act of true compassion on the part of God himself towards the needy and undeserving. The ability to do something which is humanly impossible for us to do. How many of us today desire and desperately need God's favor? Isaiah chapter 66 verse 2 says, these are the ones I look on with favor. Those who are humble, and here's this word again, contrite in spirit. Isaiah 57, I dwell with the contrite and lowly of spirit in order to revive the spirit of the lonely and to revive the heart of the contrite. Now, there's an interesting word there in Isaiah 57, the word revive. It means to restore to life and health, to sustain life. So what we're getting at is when we humble ourselves and get out of the way, then we can experience God's favor. Or another word, revival. Now, this word revival causes a lot of anxiety with people. And I know throughout our history as a nation, we've experienced many great awakenings, many revivals, even in the past 20 or 30 years. We saw what happened in the Toronto Vineyard in the 90s, what happened at Pensacola, what's been going on in Latin America for decades, and even in the last couple of years at Asbury College. I know many people begin to grow skeptical when it comes to the word revival. But yet we see when Jonah was preaching in Nineveh that there was mass repentance. On the day of Pentecost, when Peter began to preach to Jerusalem, over 3,000 people come to know Christ. And in Acts chapter 3, as once again Peter is prophesying and preaching, we see that he brings about, he talks about a time that God's going to bring about a time of refreshing on his people. And then over 2,000 people come to know Christ. So in the 21st century, I believe that we are still experiencing revival at different places in our world. But too often, sovereign moves of God are accompanied by human foolishness. Opportunistic leaders who are trying to make money or a name for themselves are promoting revival as the key to growing their churches. Or we have circuit riders, people going from revival meeting to revival meeting, but yet they're not faithful to their own local church. People begin to question, well, it's not a successful service unless people are falling to the ground and rolling around. My question is, what do you like when you get up? During the great Azusa Street Revival in the early 20th century, there was a prophecy that went forth that in the last days, more people were going to be focused on the gifts of the Holy Spirit rather than the Holy Spirit himself. Well, in the book of John, it doesn't say those that believe shall follow greater signs. It says greater signs shall follow those who believe. If we want to operate in the supernatural, we need to embrace brokenness and humility because humility is supernatural. It's contrary to this world. In my opinion, true revival is the church repenting and getting into right relationship with God. I would say that we don't need revival. We need revival. We need to simply live for God. It's when individual followers of Christ embrace the cross and the victory of that cross flows through us into a hurting and dying world. 
When we're emptied of self, we're filled with the Holy Spirit and people are saved and miracles happen. But it should never be limited to a season or a place. It needs to be part of our daily lives. Verse 21. As these foreigners or these Greeks are approaching the disciples, they ask a question that I have never been asked in my life, but I'm hoping and praying about it someday. That someone would come up to me and say, would you take us to see Jesus? We want to see him. So as we close, I'd like to invite the worship team to come forward. I just wanted to share another quick testimony of another time that I was fasting. It was early on when we had started the college church. And we were really praying for a harvest of souls. You know, we had seen a lot of church kids coming to our, our, our services, but we hadn't really seen too many confess Christ as their Savior. So that was our prayer. And I said, you know what? I want to go on this 10-day fast. I want to pray that God would bring in this this season of, 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 of planting seeds and watching people begin to confess Jesus as their Savior. So on the first day of this fast, I mean, I'm really being honest with you about my struggles fasting. So on the first day of this fast, my roommates were gone for Christmas break, and I was alone. So I had the whole apartment to myself. I would just walk and pray. And I remember kneeling down in the living room again and beginning to cry out that professors and students and administrators at the U of I and Parkland College would come to know Christ. But I just didn't really feel like there was a lot of anointing. There wasn't a lot of unction behind my prayers. There wasn't any authority. So I just felt like the Lord was wanting me to just be quiet and just pray in my spirit language and to just focus on praising him. Well, that day went by. I was just uh, on a water fast. And the next day, um, I was praying again. And as I was praying in the morning, I felt that the Lord wanted me to do something a little bit strange. So I went to my pastor at the time, and I I explained to him what was going on. And he said, well, if that's what the Lord is leading you to do, you better do it. So what God was calling me to do, please uh, humor me for a second here, was calling me to go to the middle of the UI campus, to the quad, and to lay on my face before him. So, being the mature, bold man of God that I am, I waited till 9 o'clock at night when no one was going to be out. (laughs) I went to the front steps of Fullinger Auditorium where I just stood there for 20 minutes before I could even get down on my knees. It was just really grating at my flesh. It was, I felt like I was humiliated by doing this. But finally, I was like, okay, God, this is weird, but I'm going to go ahead and be obedient to you. So I got down on my knees, and eventually I just laid prostrate before the Lord. And then I started saying, I know why I'm here. I'm here to repent of the arrogance and pride, the lack of righteousness at the University of Illinois. And so I started to pray along those lines, like, God, forgive this campus for its pride and its sin. And again, I felt the Lord asking me to just be quiet and remain still. And I heard his voice again say to me, You're here to repent of your own sin. You're here to repent of your own pride and your own arrogance. And I just started to repent. God, forgive me for my pride. Forgive me for those times that I didn't acknowledge your holiness. And he said to me, how can people on this campus acknowledge who I am if my own people don't acknowledge my holiness? So I got up from the quad, I went home, and just spent more time praying. The third day, I just still didn't feel the release to pray for souls. The fourth day, I was praying in the morning, and guess what? God said, go back to the quad. Well, this time I was a veteran, so I went at 6 o'clock. I was an expert at this. So I get to the quad, I said, okay, I'm going to do it. Lay face down waiting for God to speak to me again. 10 minutes goes by, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes goes by. I'm frozen because this is in the middle of January. I hear people going by snickering because they're like, what is this man drunk? Is he passed out? And I was like, this is it. I did not feel led to go on this fast. I haven't heard from God. I'm going home and I'm going to get something to eat. So I rush home, I get out the pots and pans, I start cooking. 
I felt that tug on my heart once again. God telling me, go get back on your knees and start praying. Turn off the stove. I get back to the couch. I kneel down. And all I uttered were the words, Jesus, bring me back to the cross. And the moment I said that, I felt this heat and this energy shoot through my body. And I began to weep. And the Lord told me, that's what's going to take. When my people come back to the cross, that's when you're going to see a harvest. And as the other students and I began to pray and pray over the next several days, we saw an incredible harvest that semester, especially among Muslims and athletes. Let me tell you, it was a great way to get basketball tickets. We saw international students come to know Christ. It wasn't, again, because of our fast. It was because God was wanting to do a work in his people first before he would bring people unto him. We close with this quote by missionary Roy Hessian. To be broken is the beginning of revival. It is painful. It is humiliating. But it is the only way. Let's go ahead and stand to our feet. These next few moments, as the worship team leads us in this song again, you might want to lift your hands if you feel comfortable doing that. But let's give God our all. Let's give God our best in these next few moments and just begin to think on these words. Now, we're not just giving him half. We're not just giving him three quarters. God, we want, to have, we want you to have everything that we are. Sing it again. I surrender all. next few moments, we just want to have a prayerful experience in God's presence. So as Pastor Ricky has us do quite often, just ask that you lift up your hands, palms up. Just begin to ask the Spirit on your own, what is my response today? You might be here today, you're thinking, wow, that's some crazy stuff that that guy was talking about, but I really want to know what it means to follow Christ and to know him as my Lord and Savior. Is it possible today that you need to be born again, as it says in John chapter 3? As we encourage people all the time, all we have to do is to admit that we're sinners, to believe that Jesus is the only way to be saved and to confess him as our Lord and Savior. Just on your own, begin to say those words, Jesus, I want you to save me. I want you to rescue me and forgive me of all my sins. As we continue, I want to give people a secret today to one of the quickest prayers to be answered. That we would all ask the Holy Spirit right now, would you search us and show me where I've grieved God? Show me areas of unconfessed sin. Holy Spirit, I give you freedom to search me right now. Show me where I need to repent. Holy Spirit, would you show me where I need to die to self? Holy Spirit, would you show me areas that are hindering your favor in my life? Oh, 
Oh God, we need you. Oh no. Are there people I need to forgive? Are there people I've been bitter towards? Are there attitudes or things that I need to let go of? Begin to just give those to him right now. Are there rights that we need to surrender? I'll be the first one to say, I need God to break my sense of entitlement, believing that I deserve certain things. I need God to help me to surrender to him. Holy Spirit, as you continue to search our hearts, would you reveal any hardness or coldness that we need to repent of? God, any mistakes or failures that I've made in the past, help me to move past them. It's not just about forgiving myself, but it's realizing that you help me to stand up again, to be your child, to walk in victory. God, would you help us to be contrite, to be humble and to be broken. And as our palms are still up, I would just, I would say this carefully, but as I was praying earlier, I just heard in my, in my heart, God saying that there's someone here specifically today. You just need to hear the word. It's time to live again. You've been bound by failure and mistakes for too long. You've been walking in darkness, thinking that God could never forgive you that your time of grace and favor was done and that you were only going through the motions. But would you receive this word from God today? It's time to live again. And God, in all of our hearts, would you rain down your favor? Would you revive us? Would you use us for your kingdom? That even this week, that people would ask us, would you take us to see Jesus? We want to see him. Father, we just come before you again and say thank you for your son Jesus who laid down his life for us, showing us a true example of humility and brokenness. And we ask that you would help us to demonstrate these attitudes in our lives, that it would be a heartfelt change and transformation that takes place. We thank you for this word that at times it may have hurt, but that you love us so much that you're willing to discipline us so that we could get up stronger and more able to serve you and to serve others. Just ask that you would bless us today and throughout this 21 days of prayer and fasting that you continue to speak to us and lead us on this process that you have. God, we thank you for Stone Creek Church. We thank you for a pastor who honors you and prays and who worships you. We pray that you would bless him this morning as well. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said... Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for uh, humoring me as I shared that word today. I guarantee you it was, it was very difficult for me to prepare for that. You know, I, I always ask God that, you know, he would deal with me first before I share a message. But we want to thank you again for coming today. If you prayed to receive Christ, or again, if you are new here, we'd just like to ask you to stop by our welcome area on the way out. We'd like to invite our leaders to come forward. If you need prayer for any area in your lives today, would you just go ahead and uh, approach one of these leaders and they will agree with you in prayer. 
Thank you again for coming, and may you enjoy the rest of your day. Be blessed this week.